kinds of groups of living things, dinosaurs or, or whatever you want. The dinosaurs are kind of a latecomer to that to those studies, and we're excited about those. But there's been over a hundred different groups that have been analyzed by pheromenologists uh, over the last twenty years. Hmm. Right. So, so pheromenology. Um, I do get. I talk to a lot of evolutionists and atheists and people who are critical of the creationists. Uh, point of view. A question I often am asked is what is the exact definition of a kind? A, a kind, we, we map to Genesis where it says that God created every living thing according to its kind. Now what, is, what does that mean? We think what it means is, is there's going to be group, there are going to be groups of animals in nature that are defined by their morphology, their genetics, their ecology, their functional morphology, their common designs, their biochemistry, and all the other attributes we might say, and they're defined as being more closely related to one another than they are to other groups outside of themselves, and that those groups are separated by significant differences. Discontinuity. Right. So, um, I heard Kurt Wise explain it like this. I, I heard Kurt Wise on a, on a talk he gave on the Is Genesis History's um, um, Compass Classroom, I believe it's called. And he says that a kind, he defines a kind as a, a group of animals w with significant continuity separated by other groups of animals with a gulf of discontinuity, significant discontinuity. Is that, did I say that right? Yes, you did, and, and that, that's a good definition. And the definition Dr. Wise gave mm -hmm. is a little more mathematical in its tone. Okay. Mine was a little more biological in its tone, but they're both saying the same thing. And so uh, if you want to think of it in terms of the biology, what would say is the, uh, the reproductive features uh, or, or capabilities, the morphology and everything, they're all similar. But if you want to talk about it in terms of the statistics, what we actually do with the statistics, yes, that's Dr. Dr. Wise has that definition. That's absolutely true. We'd say it's significantly statistically similar to other, other, um, other entities, those species or those genera or whatever are statistically more similar to those, those others than they are to others outside of them. Right. All right. Uh, sorry about that. Somebody decides to call me when I go live, but no, I'm not going to answer yet. Um, <laughs> um, it, all right. So, and this is the next question that I have for you. It seems as though phylogenetic analyses are important for these kind of studies, these baronological studies. Um, what would be your response for so to somebody who would say, don't use phylogenetics because it assumes universal common descent? All right. Well, I think that the phylogenetic trees, first of all, are, however, what they're all going to do is they're going to take all the, all the groups in your, in, your, um, in your study set and they're going to force them all to a common ancestor. Mm. Whether there's a common ancestor or not, you are going to get, by definition, a common ancestor because that's what the software does. You tell the software to link all these groups together. Now, if they are all linked together, you're going to mask or, or give you a misdirection on that. And so what we did is we're trying to come up with methodologies to say, if there's a, if there's a discontinuity, where is it and can we see it? And that's really all that we're trying to do. And so we would say that the phylogenetic analyses are one way to approach some of these questions, but they're not the only way to approach these questions. And we want to add some, add some tools to that, to that, um, those, those sets of studies where we want to look at living things. Economy for the cladistic system? That's a great question. You're asking some really great questions here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, um, it, and there's, you know, there's a lot of philosophy behind that. I might have to kind of, kind of go into a little bit of philosophy here because we mentioned Aristotle. The Linnaean system 
is very Aristotelian in its in its framework. And for Christians, particularly, our intellectual tradition, our intellectual history as Christians, goes back thousands of years. So unlike uh, modern scientists, modern scientists don't often root a lot of their thinking in great histories of, of philosophical systems like like we can in theology and philosophy and apologetics. We have we have a lot of philosophy. Christians have been doing philosophy for thousands of years. People have only been doing science for about three or four hundred years. What we would call modern science is only three or four hundred years old. Philosophy goes back a long ways and the philosophical construct of the Linnaean approach is a typological way of viewing things that Aristotle had that I don't think we can ever really get rid of. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. And there's an important reason for that. Um, and that is, it seems that both the mind and reality around us is structured in a certain way in such that it's very natural to think in those categories. And so right now I know in um, dinosaur phylogenetics and other places that the Linnaean system seems to be going away. And it may go right. away for a while, but it's hard to imagine that it's ultimately really going to go away. And one of the reasons for that is, is uh, if I take this folder that, uh, that I have right here, all right, I have papers inside my folder, right? I take my papers, put them in my folder. As I prepare for classes, I do this a lot, right? I've got a lot of folders here, all right? So I put my, my papers in my folder, right? Right. And you take the folder, and maybe this folder can go inside of a bigger folder, mm. which goes inside of a bigger folder, right? which goes inside of the top drawer in my filing cabinet to my right, okay. which is only one of three or four drawers in my filing cabinet. And so I think you can see what I'm saying here is that the human mind seems to map to a reality outside of us that recognizes that we can group things in, in, in the world around us, whether it's things we make or it's things we see in biology. We can group smaller things into bigger sets, into bigger sets, into bigger sets, into bigger sets, and that's where the, the Linnaean system comes from. And what's so interesting about this, I like what Dr. Wise says about this, and that is one of the evidences for evolution early on was that realization that I just told you, that we have some smaller things grouped inside of bigger things, inside of bigger things, inside of bigger things. Species, genus, family, order, and so on. Okay, how do we explain that in a creation framework? And it's actually very easy to explain that, and that is because... Not only does the natural world look like that, but everything that you and I make, everything that other people make, can be classified and is classified the same way. So, for instance, outside my window here, I have my car, a four-wheel vehicle, which is next to a minivan, which is a slightly different four-wheel vehicle, which we could put on the road next to an 18-wheeler or a motorcycle, which is a two-wheeler. And, and you see that we create things in these sets of things that we can keep grouping into larger and larger sets. We have motorized vehicles and we have non-motorized vehicles and we have all these types of types of entities that we create that sort themselves out like this, very much like a Linnaean classification. I don't know if you ever thought about that, mm -hmm. but if you take cars or boats or computers you could take the Linnaean classification and apply it to those things just as easily as you could the living world. Mm. And so that tells us that there's something about that that has a reality to it. And again, from, from a creationist standpoint, that's very exciting. And I don't think it's going to go anywhere because I don't think that it, it can ultimately go anywhere, that it could right. go anywhere else. Yes, we do have some problems sometimes. Yes, there are those those tricky things. It's like, okay, you find this thing. You're like, where does this critter go? Right. right. You know, and it's, it's really hard. Yeah. You have to kind of stick it in another box somewhere that does happen. So, but at the same time, it's hard to imagine how we're going to think too far outside that framework 
that we ourselves build things in terms of. I hope that wasn't too long of an answer. No, that, that, that answer was your question. It's a very good philosophical question, and there's there, there's there's a lot to that. We could really go into that. Right. That that was a great answer. I I I, I love. See, here's the thing. I really, really like long, nerdy talks. That's why I listen to so many of them. <laughs> I, I, I listen to um, some channels. Uh, I listen to some YouTube channels uh, that, that host like two-hour long, three-hour-long uh, conversations on like phylogenetics. And, 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 sure. And it's, I, I, I give blown away. Now, I'm not sure if you can see it, stick around and talk for two hours. I'm, actually, how long, did you, <laughs> how long did you want to go for? Because... <laughs> well, I think I'm probably like after about an hour, I probably have to go deal with a few other things as my classes start, uh, or my right. students are going to be mad at me. But um, uh, right. but I, I could do the same thing too. I think uh, earlier in the summer I could have had a little more time, but I'm getting close to the end of the semester now. So uh, yes. not that you didn't contact me early enough, so I apologize. We couldn't get get together a little earlier. No, no, it's all it's all right. It's all it's all it's all good. Um, but I do have a couple more questions, um, but I do want to get to the paper. So before we, before we yeah, get sure. too far into the other questions, which uh, we'll save for a later date. But uh, let, let's get into the paper, if you'd like. Uh, so I have power of the Internet. Uh, so let me see if I, if I get this right. All right, there we go. Okay, so the audience can now see the paper that, I, that we are going to be discussing in our... I'll share my screen with you also, Dr. Doran, uh, in a moment. Uh, technical difficulties. Oh, man. All right. Well, well, there we go. Okay. Dead air. Man, that's not good. Okay. So let me, let me share my screen with you, Dr. Doran. And uh, share screen. There we go. Start sharing. There we go. Can you see the paper? Yes. All right, great. So this is the paper that we're going to be talking about, everybody. This is the paper that Dr. Doran co-authored with, uh, authored with Dr. Matthew McLean, Natalie Young. I, I'm assuming Natalie Young is a, is a student at the Bryan College? Yes. Yes? Yeah. All right. Huh? All right, because I couldn't find her. Um, but Dr. McLean, we had him on a couple of other times, I believe three times in total, and we'll, we'll probably have to have him on again with you, Dr. Doran, to talk about uh, this sure. paper. Um, but today we're just going to talk about uh, the methods and the results of the paper. Explain to us what methods were used in, in, in this study. All right, sure. Um I I, uh, I brought a little illustration here. I don't know if uh, your audience can see it. All right. Let me see. Oh, are you screen sharing? Okay. I uh, no. I just I'm holding right. something right right uh, in my hands right here. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. All right. Now, barominology. If you look at some of the charts on there, I could probably give you a number here. Like if you went to a certain figure. You see those little charts that have little squares and circles? Right. The barominology distance charts? Mm hmm Remember those? These ones. You could probably even show one there. Let me show it for the audience. There we go. Can you see that? Or did it stop screen sharing? Okay, there's, there's one right there. There we go. All right. And the black squares show significant similarity and the white open circles show significant dissimilarity. And so that's one way for us to define the Brahmin. But what we did in this paper is a little bit different. And one of the advantages we have in our paper is to look at, be able to look at some of the higher classifications. So for instance, it seems like we talk about Behrmans, the holobearman is what we're looking for, what's called the holobearman. It seems to often come up under the level of family, taxonomic family, the Linnaean family. The method that we're using, we can look at any type of hierarchy. We can look at we can look at families, we can look at orders, we can look at phyla, 
and we can see it all laid out spatially. And maybe you could uh, go to one of those charts there, maybe that first one up on page uh, 10 there, it looks like, maybe the one before it, okay. where you have the axes that, um, you have a couple of different axes there. There you go. So you've got like PC3, PC, PC1. All right. All right, that's a good one. All right. Yeah, that's a good one. And let me explain what's going on there. I think this is really exciting and really, really interesting. And that is, I'm going to explain it this way. I'm going to use, I'm going to use this, uh, this little stick right here and uh, dinosaur features. And let's say we take some dinosaurs and we sort them on the basis of their size. Smallest to the left and largest to the right. So imagine an axis here, kind of a mathematical axis where we have dinosaurs all laid out small over here, large over here. If you do that, that'll give you a lot of information about dinosaurs. All right, but there's more to dinosaurs than their size. Just their, again, I'm defining size by nose to tail length on this axis here. So very, very small ones over here, all the way up to the gigantic ones here on the, on the right. All right. Well, what about some other features of dinosaurs? What about, what about standing height? Let's say that's another trait. So what about the height of a dinosaur as it's standing upright? Let's say it's an upright standing dinosaur. As it's standing upright from toe to head, how, how, how tall are those dinosaurs, all right? Well, let's take another axis here. And I, I think you can see that. I've got two, two of these axes right here like this. Can you see that? Right. All right. And remember on this bottom axis I had, what was the overall size of the dinosaur down here? On this one, I'm asking, what is the overall height of that dinosaur? How high is that dinosaur when it stands? All right. Now you can see when we do this that we're going to get dinosaurs and we're going to have like a, a set of relationships to those dinosaurs out here. Does that make some sense? Yes, sir. All right. Well, Dinosaur drivers do more than that, all right? So let's let's ask another question here. I have a third axis right here. I'm just going to run it like this, right? Okay. And if I do this, you've got a, you've got a box right here. I don't know if you can can see like yes. like a box right here, right? And so we add another axis here, and maybe we can ask about femur size because often the the femur, the back legs, tell a lot about the animals its motion, its ability to run or stand, or even its ability to hold prey down. It's a, it's a powerful femur, say, powerful back leg. All right, let's ask that on this axis, all right? Now, when we do that, hopefully you can see, you can imagine there's a box right here, right? Mm -hmm. right. And in that box, in those, in those three dimensions, we can start seeing that there's groups and clusters of dinosaurs that start to show up all right now what's interesting with that is is that when we look at dinosaur data sets there's not just three characters but there might be 500 or more characters hmm. now that's okay for what i just showed you because by eye you and i can only see the three axes but the computer can see thousands it can see an infinite series of these lines that are orthogonal at, at 90 degrees like this, mm. okay? And if you could imagine what that would be like, we can't imagine it, the computer can kind of show us, but um, what you're going to have is you're going to start breaking dinosaurs out into, into clusters and groups. So obviously a stegosaurid-type dinosaur is going to look a lot, a lot different than some theropod dinosaurs, obviously. And then within the theropod dinosaurs, you're going to get other distinctions and so on. All right, so that's a long way into it. But if you look at this chart on the, on the page in front of you, you see axis one against axis two going vertical. And you see the dinosaur names on there. You see a bunch of dinosaur names. And the advantage of this study is this, this approach to the statistics and math of the dinosaurs means that whenever you see two dinosaur names that are very close together, those two dinosaurs are very, very similar 
in their morphologies. At the same time, two dinosaurs that are a little farther apart are a little less alike, and then two dinosaurs that are very, very far, uh, very, very um, distantly spaced on the chart are very, very different types of organisms. And again, we can do that um, because this is there are many, many different angles we can have here. These are two on here. Remember, I said there's three and four and five and six. Right. There are all kinds of ways that we can we can look at that. Um, one and two axes show up here, and we see it from one perspective. But we could also flip that box over and look at it in another perspective. But the long story short here is that when I see clusters of things close together, it means those types of things are very similar to each other, and then things that are farther apart are very different from each other. Right. All right. So, so that's basically what's uh, what the, what is going on here. So, I, I wanted to ask you. There, I do see some groups here that are not included in Dinosauria. Uh, Dimorphodons up here. Are these the? Are these like the outgroup taxa over here? Yes, exactly right. And right. that's that's one thing I like about the analysis. We can take things that are dinosaur-like like. or have some features of dinosaurs, an outgroup, mm -hmm. and we can put it on there. We can see spatially how it relates, and notice how far away they are. Right. That's, ex that's exactly what we imagine. If it's an outgroup and it's outside, it's far away. And you can probably even see the word outgroup on there. If you scroll up to the top, right you might there. even see the word. Yeah, there it is out there. Right. I made that one up for reference. Right. Out. So that's far away from everybody else, just as just as we would expect. And so that's not like anything else that's on here. But then when we see the, the clustering of points that are close together, we see that some of these groups are very similar to each other, then others have gaps. There are, there are spaces between them. And those are those are investigations into the created kind or the Brahmin or the whole of Brahmins that we want to start looking at. Right. So if you were to zoom... Did that help a little bit? <laughs> yes, sir. That actually really did. Uh, so, if you, so if you could zoom in here in, in like a 3D model, uh, ba like I see here Cryolophosaurus and Coelophysis are kind of like in the same, like really close together in the same group. So that's what I thought was going on. It's because of the outgroup taxa that are there. Um, but this is a figure for reference, which is kind of showing like yeah, we our speculation, like our like our uh, spe uh, yeah speculation that Dimorphodon and Postosuchus they're not in Dinosauria. Yeah, it's actually kind of it's, right. it's it's right, you know. Um, That's right, exactly. And we've got these two other big groups. We've got the sauropods on the one hand, and maybe the theropods on the other hand. Right. And they're different. They're separated. They have all that see all that gray space in between there. The uh, the gray space there. Those are arrows. They kind of overprinted the chart a little bit, which uh, um, we have a better set of charts now. But um, but you can see that there's like a, a distance and a, and a discontinuity. There's a separation between those groups, and that's exactly what we would expect. Right. So, but if you were to zoom in, like if this image were to be like a 3D image and you could zoom in like a lot, th this would be like a really big gap here between Cryolophosaurus and Coelophysis, right? Yes. And in fact, we could go to that group if we want to in the paper and then zoom in and have a closer look at it. So this, I like that you started with this. This um, this uh, chart kind of gives a bird's eye view of all the dinosaurs all at right. once. And then from there in the paper, we just go on and go into the ornithicians and then, you know, stegosaurus and ornithopods and all that. And then we go to the theropods. We could look at manoraptorans or tyrannosaurids or or other things that you might be interested in. Right, so I see here Manoraptor forms. That's right. Which, I do have a couple of questions. Um, yes. It's it's probably going to take us a while to get through this, so we're probably not going to go figure <laughs> by figure. <laughs> but, um, so I think it's the, this one right here, this figure. Uh, this is what? This figure five. Um, okay. Let's talk about this. So I see that Eoraptor, sure. Herrerasaurus, and Ornithischia are kind of like on the same 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 um, same figure um, I what is kind of like our our idea our, our consensus on Eoraptor what what was Eoraptor Eoraptor um, 
I'm sorry, I can't really see that on the screen. Uh, it's is it not sharing? Um, technical difficulties. It's live. All right. So. Uh, uh, Pisanosaurus. I see Neorth. Uh, Neotheropoda, Saturnalia. Eoraptor is right on the bottom, all the way on the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry. There's something on my screen that's blocking that. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, that's okay. Um, I can't quite see what's going on there, but it looks like it might be, it might be in the outgroup portion okay. of the bit, what we call the barometric distance chart. Mm. And so those uh, clusters of squares show that those more or less seem to grow together. But on this one, we're looking a little bit more at basal cerecia. And mm. so the, the Saturnalia, the Sauropodomorpha, uh, uh, Gobiosaurus, those, uh, those will cluster together as well. So we didn't have a lot of dinosaurs on this one. Right. If you notice, this might be like maybe like a 2004 or other paper that is a little bit older. Yeah, 2004. And so we started with the older papers, and then we went on to the newer ones. Right. And what this gave us another interesting insight, and that was that as you go from the older to the newer, you see a lot more definition and a lot more detail, which, which you would expect. But this matrix was very limited mm. on what it could give us. Mm. But the next one was a, was a little bit more explanatory. Okay. And is, is that figure eight? Or which one goes into a little bit more detail after after all right let me just have a look here so this was all published in like a like a volume right in 2018 yes yeah 2018 yeah so and it looks like you're on page 12 yes sir somebody at our somebody at, a, at my church he he has like a lot of the uh Institute for Creation Research uh, volumes, and he said he's gonna let me borrow one to 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 read a couple of the papers. But uh, right, well, uh, it looks like uh, are you on are you on uh, number eight? I think you're on number eight, figure eight. Figure eight, yes, sir. Okay, now here again we have a lot more detail now on this one. It's a different data set. There's more that's in, that uh, that's included there, and. Um, some of the uh, some of the tags are a little bit a little bit hard to read, but the uh, the particular genus that you're interested in is probably on here, right? And I forgot which one you're interested in. Uh, Eoraptor, I believe. Uh, Eoraptor is right there. Lunsensis. Okay, yeah. Uh huh. Right. There. And what this is showing us right there, Eoraptor seems to be in a set that's uh, pretty far removed from some of these other groups here. Mm. And so here we have, on the left, we have the theropods down, on, down near the bottom, and on the top, uh, the uh, ornithischians again. And our outgroup taxa are down toward the right on this one. Okay. And so our outgroups form a bit of a a cluster there down in the bottom toward the right. And do you see all the white space between them and the rest of them? Right. Okay, that shows that there's kind of, there's quite a gap there in between those and whatever whatever else is over on the other side. So the one you're interested in, the uh, the Eoraptor, is actually really quite far away from that from that outgroup, as okay. you can see there. Right. But it's much more closely aligned with, say, Hararosaurus. Mm-hmm. Right. So, are Herarosaurus and Eoraptor kind of like in their own groups? Or are they like separated from each other? Or is this... What, what's kind of going on here? Because are they separated from Ornithischia? Or... Okay. All right. Now, that's a good question. What we need to do then for that is uh, either look at maybe the third axis here. Okay. And if you go to figure nine... What we do is we can take that. Sometimes when we look at it in, in one perspective like this, mm -hmm. two might look like they're close together, but they might actually be really separated by a far space. You see my hands, how they're, right. how they're changing like this? So again, there are those realities. Some, some uh, genera are going to look similar in one perspective, 
but they actually have more separation on another axis. Mm -hmm. If they're really close on all the axes, then they are indeed very close. Some axes they might be a little more separated from. So let's have a look here. That's a good question. Eoraptor is... Euparcaria is up there, and Postosuchus, I think. Coelophysis is here. Allosaurus. Eoraptor, right there. Lunsensis. Okay. Eoraptor, and you're looking at it in terms of a Herarosaurus? Yes, it's right over a Herarosaurus. Okay, this is showing us that Eoraptor and Herarosaurus, by this data matrix that we have, mm -hmm. they're very close to one another. Okay. Now, are they the same created kind? Would they be in the same Brahmin? We need to do some more study on that, but it looks like from here, we're at a good vantage point to say, I might want to look a little more closely. We might want to add a little more data. We might want to do some other statistical tests, but given this data set in, um, what year was this? This was uh, 2009, I think. According to this data in 2009, the best that we can tell, Herarosaurus mm -hmm. looks very similar to Eoraptor. Okay, right. At least it looks more similar to Eoraptor than, Herarosaurus looks more similar to Eoraptor than maybe, um, say, Sard Saturnalia does, or... Uh, Velociraptor does mm -hmm. that have more more distance, more space between them. Right. Yeah, and I also see that Platysaurus is uh, is also very close to Eoraptor, which it is. Now, on the other diagram we're looking at, I didn't see Platysaurus nearby, so that might have been one of those examples where when you when you change the axis perspective. There might be there might be that effect going on as well. Right. So let's take a look there. Where was Pla okay, Platyosaurus, there it is. It's up there. Yes. So sir. it's a little bit farther away. This is a good example. You, right. You, you have a great example here. Herarosaurus and Eoraptor are a bit closer together, but Platyosaurus looks like there's a little more there's a little more distance there. But if you look at it in some ways, it looks a little more close right. together, right? This is a great example in something in biology that we call either convergence or mosaic biology, okay. meaning that sometimes two organisms might look strangely similar but be very different organisms. One example we might give there is the duckbill platypus, okay. right? Right, yeah. Duckbill platypus is the weird critter, right? By anybody's yes. standards, right? Yes. You don't have to be a creationist or an evolutionist. Duckbill platypus is just weird, right? Doing verminological studies on that would be a nightmare. <laughs> That's right, exactly. So um, when we have that one, it's going to have some features that are like a reptile, but at the same time, it's not really, you know, if you look at it right. in some ways, it does kind of look like a reptile, but in other ways, it's kind of, okay. you know, what's going on there, right? right. I, I understand. I see what you're saying. Yes. Right. Now, I'm not saying Platyosaurus is that bad. So, okay. <laughs> Platyosaurus isn't that bad, but I'm just, I, I'm just saying you, you had a good example there. I like your example with uh, Eoraptor and Harosaurus being closer together, but Platyosaurus is a little farther away, not too dissimilar, but a little further away. Mm. But that's a great example of what we're seeing here. Well, all right. All right, makes sense. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from a friend of mine, uh, the dapper sure. dinosaur. Uh, he says, um, he says, were any ornithurin taxa included? I'm sorry, what? Ornithurin taxa. Uh, O-R-N-I-T-H-U-R-A-N. Or any of, or any attacks that from that group included in the study. All right. Well, uh, what I did uh, on my end, I surveyed. We surveyed hundreds and hundreds of taxa. Right. And I don't recall if we got one of those. It could be. It could be that's a group that may have fallen out of the analyses because we didn't have enough data. Okay. Or that it wasn't in a data set that uh, that I ran. Now, at the same time, it might be one of these. We might have a representative in one of these charts, but um, it's a big paper, off the though. top of my head, I can't recall. Yeah, it's a big paper. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I had to raid the the paper supplies in our house and the ink to just to print it. Um, yes, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, so let let us uh, that's very insightful. Also, us uh, because 
I'm not sure if you saw my interview with uh, Dr. Paul Serino. Paul Serino. No, I didn't. Paul Serino, I believe he uh, he he described Eoraptor back in the 90s, I believe it was, or the early 2000s, and he describes it as a basal or an ethiscian, uh, like a very very basal or, or or primitive form of ornithischians uh, and that's why I thought that this study was interesting because it placed or, uh, Eoraptor very closely uh, with the other uh, taxa which I didn't think should be the same kind but I uh, now it makes sense a, a little bit more sense to me because now we're just looking at it at different angles and the convergence also and that's also another question that I would, I would like to ask you um, does convergent evolution and uh, and uh, things like phenotypic plasticity impact these studies or results in a, in a meaningful way? All right. Okay. All right. Two, those are I'd see those as two very different things. Let me go to phenotypic right. plasticity first, mm -hmm. and then convergence. Right. Phenotypic plasticity is usually something that's very small and localized, mm -hmm. like in a in a group of organisms. So, for instance, like Let's say that um, organisms want to kind of make th th there are slight modifications in an environment where there's a plasticity of genetic expression. Right. And so the characters that we're looking at, for the most part, in these data sets, I imagine, have really uh, not included much that would be come under the domain of phenotypic plasticity. Mm. On the other hand, and here's something that's just really, really um, funny. Uh, I have to. This might take a little time to explain. Do you mind that? No, that that'd be fine. That'd be fine. Okay. Um, uh, when I started, uh, I started actually kind of uh, working with Dr. Wise when I was a graduate student. Okay. And um, we would talk about the idea that these studies, once computers came out and they started to to look at the relationships between these these um, these trees, the various living groups, they found convergence everywhere. Mm. And let me explain that for a minute. Convergence means, let's say we have two different groups of plants. Let's say both plants have chlorophyll, which they mm. do. They need chlorophyll to make lighting. The assumption was that the chlorophyll for both those plants go back to a common ancestor, right? Okay. All right. Here's what they found when they actually started putting this data in the computers and running these up these these trees. Mm -hmm. They found that chlorophyll, they couldn't get chlorophyll to go down to a common ancestor. And so by the trees, they found out that chlorophyll had to evolve like 40 different times independently of one another. <laughs> what? <laughs> And and all these bizarre things just started coming up, and Doctor Wise and I would just we would just laugh and, and laugh about that because we thought this was so bizarre and unexpected in the evolutionary side of things. Right. And that's what convergence is. Mm. Why on earth would, for instance, there be a placental mouse in a marsupial mouse? Mm. Placental mammals have mice. Marsupials have mice. Placentals wow. have flying squirrels, and marsupials have something like a flying squirrel. That's right. totally yeah, yeah. bizarre. Yeah. And so, on the creation side of it, what we just do is we say, "Well, look, there isn't just one tree. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. why we have convergence." There's not one tree. There's lots of trees. Right. And one way we can understand them is these methods where you can kind of see clusters and groups of things. And so we're very we're very comfortable with the idea of convergence. Convergence isn't a problem for what we're doing. Mm. Convergence is a problem if you're assuming common ancestry of things. Then you have to explain why did two features evolve two, three, four times. I don't know if you saw that. Now they're saying that flight evolved four times in dinosaurs. Yeah. Four, what? Four times in four dinosaurs? Times. 
In dinosaurs? <laughs> wow. That's... <laughs> All right. It's like, yeah. wait a minute. How? Wait. I thought it was hard to happen once. Right. I thought once was enough. Four times? Yeah. <laughs> so um, for us, it's just that's just a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. For us, that's not a problem. Problem. We, we're just asking a different question. We're just trying to find those groups, and we can see those groups here. And so your Eoraptor right here looks to me like it's close to the Ornithischians here. There's a gap between them, so they might they might be a little different than Ornithischians. We might we might want to wait for more data, but I do see a big white space here between Eoraptor and a bunch of other things. Right. So it looks like Eoraptor and Brontosaurus are similar to one another. They're a little bit closer to Ornithischians, but they're also very different from a lot of other things. So that's how you would interpret this chart. I think it's very, hopefully it's very simple, and your uh, your listeners uh, will uh, enjoy looking at this and, yes. and begin to understand. It's not so hard to read it. Yeah. I, when I when I when I first printed out the paper, I'm like, ah, oh, that's gonna be fun. <laughs> <laughs> um. But now, now that you've uh, now that you've kind of explained it uh, it a little bit more and and, and kind of uh, show uh, explained what what we're exactly seeing here, I think that a lot of the people in the audience are going to be able to understand it a little bit easy a little bit easier. Um, right. What, what I'd say is, go to your favorite dinosaur group. And let's have a look at it. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's What's talk. What's your favorite? I. I like studying, so I, I, I've been I, I've been kind of into this whole feather dinosaurs thing, and so that's All what. All right, go to the Manoraptorans. Yeah. You want to go to the Manoraptorans then? I forgot what 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 uh, page it's on. Do you know what? Do you happen to know what page it's on? The Manoraptorans. You're right there. Right here. You got it. Oh, okay. I see Foth and Rahut. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I see Foth and Rahut. All right. Great. We're here. All right. Let's get right into it. So what are there we looking are. at here? I see... I don't know what that is. Garu the Mimus. Okay, we have Shuvia yeah, here. Mimus, got Shuvia. Uh-huh. Ornithalestes, Cineraptor. Uh -huh, yeah. T-Rex is... Or, yeah, T-Rex is in here. Gorg okay. Yeah, so that's your outgroup. Notice the little outgroup sign right there. Right. So you're in an outgroup, right? Okay. And so yeah. I see Cadipteryx. Cidipati, uh, -huh. uh Confuciusornis. I still don't know how to pronounce that. I should. Okay. Confuciusornis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here we have my favorite group. Okay. Microraptor, Simon. Okay. Velociraptor, Microraptors. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. right. And then up here we have, I don't know what this is. Yishianornis. Yanornis. Ichthyornis. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> we have hey, Gallus. Let me find those two in my paper. So we have the chicken here, also. I'm, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, Gallus. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. so this is interesting. So we have the the Manoraptorans pretty separated from from Gallus, and and uh, I'm assuming that these are base or not basal, but uh, extant birds up here. Extant, exactly. Yes. So that's interesting. We do have we do have a bit of discontinuity here. They're pretty far apart. That's right. So. That's right. And notice we have a little bit of a wishbone there too. Pretty interesting about this diagram. So as you, you're, you're looking at some of the spaces, right? Okay. But there's something else that's really interesting here. Um, we have those little groups, right? Mm -hmm. And notice I have those numbers on there. Okay. Those numbers are the order that these groups appear in the fossil record. Huh. Okay. Now, if I expected those to have one common ancestor and then evolve in sequence, mm -hmm. what would you expect for the numbers? I would expect them to be in this order that it would look like it would be a transition from one organism to another. Right. One, two, three, right. four, five, six, right? Right. What do you see? I see chaos. <laughs> <laughs> Don't uh, insult my work like that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I see. I see. That's kind the way of, it came out. That's what came out. I see a lot of mis uh, mismatch here. Right. So they're just kind of, just kind of, uh, 
kind of popping in and out of there. Kind so, of shuffled. Uh, that was kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, Dapper Dinosaur said, asks if Milig Miliagris is in here. Uh, I could probably try to find it. But what? So let's talk about the results, though, because th this is this is interesting. Why do we see the supposed very bird-like dinosaurs so far away from actual and ex extant birds? Well, one of the reasons in this chart is extant birds are very very different looking than mm -hmm. some of the um, some of the um, the uh, uh, dromaeosaurs. Right. They look very different. Right. And in some ways. Now, there is anatomy that's in, in, in common. And I know people are very interested in the, 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 the bird dinosaur question and all mm -hmm. that. And, uh, and some Christians are very concerned about that. I'm, I'm not. Mm -hmm. uh, this bones and the anatomies. And, um, and based on that, they have these sorts of relationships. And again, some are closer to others. But... Um, the uh, the living birds have some anatomies that are that are very unique uh, compared to some of these. Though there is there is some similarity there, mm -hmm. and um, and so we do we do definitely note that. But um, but there are there are differences by this data set uh, between some of the extant groups and um, these other uh, maniraptoran groups, like the dromaeosaurs or like the troodontids or something like that. Right. All right. So what are, so what are we what are we scaling here? So, like these numbers on the side, on the axes, PC two and PC one. What are these? Uh, I forgot what these stand for. Refresh my memory, real quickly. All right, sure. I'll, I'll explain it again. On the uh, remember our little our little stick diagram here. Right. Like uh, this this axis right here is showing us what the computer thought was the most important difference in all of these groups, mm. and. When you go from left to right, the most variation in the groups are explained by that one axis down there. Okay. And so notice we have the, the modern birds and number five on the side, and then we have those others on the right. Okay. And so there's, there's, something, there's something about those two sets that look very different in some ways. Okay. Then when we look at PC number two, then we go on this other axis here. And this other axis is showing us there's something else going on up and down the chart as you look at it. Right. And if we wanted to look at the numbers much more closely, I didn't have time to look at all these numbers. There are many numbers here. I didn't have time to look at them all very closely. Mm -hmm. But we could begin to locate what some of those features were. Maybe it was the design of the hands. Maybe it was the length of the tail. Maybe it was had to do with skull features or jaw features or, right. or what have you but you could actually probably just take some 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 images of some dinosaurs there or some anoraptors and just kind of even paste them on that chart i encourage you to do that if you're interested paste the little pictures on there and look at it and look at look what they look like and you'll see it'll make sense to you how they are distributed and how they how they fall out right right we're drawing close to the hour mark, Dr. Doran. Uh, but, and it's time has flown by. I, I had a lot of fun uh, today. Um, but I, I do want to ask you um, sure. if I wanted to do a, a bare if I wanted to conduct a baromenological study on my own, what would I do? What should I do? All right. Well, the, uh, the baromenology research started at Bryan College. I'm at Bryan College. Okay. And Dr. Todd Wood, Dr. Kurt Wise were, were three of the people who started the group. Dr. Todd Wood does uh, baromenology with the, um, the um, baromenic distance charts right here. Right. Those. Uh, those. And then I do, I do some of the ones with the... Um, those component charts where you're kind of looking at the, the mm -hmm. layout of the critters. Right. I do some of those, and I'm working on some of those. But um, it, it may be possible we could even uh, work with you online or something or uh, work with you on a project. And uh, we would also invite you and any of your listeners 
to some of our uh, bear monology, or our, I keep calling it bear, the bear monology study group is what we first call ourselves. It's now called the Creation Biology Society. Okay. Um, when we started, we called ourselves the bear monology study group. Uh, yeah. We're studying these things. Okay. Uh, but we still are doing that. We just call ourselves the Creation Biology Society. Mm -hmm. And we meet once a year in the summer for a research conference. And then we meet around the country in um, what are called um, uh, like local retreats. Like we have the Smoky Mountain Retreat uh, here in Tennessee. There are others in the Midwest. Maybe it's a little closer to you in the Midwest. But we definitely invite you to come out and, uh, and hang out with us a little bit. And uh, But... Um, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Uh, uh, it looks like you have Dr. Woods' uh, page up there. Yes, sir. And so we can enter, enter things on there. And so he does um, some cluster analysis. I didn't get a chance to explain cluster analysis, but I'm doing some of that as well. And um, but we'd uh, invite you or any of your any of your listeners to uh, contact us uh, either at Bryan College or Core Academy of Science, mm -hmm. where Dr. Wood is. And we can take you through if there's a if there's a group you're interested in looking at a little more closely, and getting some data and uh, trying to analyze and, and figure out what's going on with this group. What, yeah. what are going on with these critters? What, how do how do they relate to one another? And so we're all very interested in those questions. That that'd be amazing, doc, Dr. Doran. And, <laughs> and I'm kind of we're going to talk about this one later, uh, not not today. Absolutely. But at a future date. Absolutely. This is by M. Okay. M. Aaron. Um, but I know you got to run, but I'm going to shut the stream down before, before, before you leave. So I want to say to everybody, uh, take Dr. Doran up on his word, go uh, to the Bryan College's website, contact the Bryan College if you want to conduct any verminological study. I'm going to do what you, and uh, what you said to do, Dr. Doran. I'm going to contact, uh, the, the, uh, the mentioned, uh, uh communities and, uh, and, and, uh, I do want to conduct these, uh, some of those studies similar to what you've done in the past we would love to have you love to love to have you join that's what we're here for and we want to uh get as many participants can many students as we can joining us and having fun and just really just trying to understand some of our favorite groups and understand what's going on in the biology and the geology and the fossil record and philosophy and history right, we're yeah. doing all kind of theology we do all kinds of studies so it doesn't have to just be a Student that's interested in dinosaurs out there, then we welcome you. There could be anybody that's interested in any of those questions about the history of creationism or history of uh, creationist thought or, or philosophy or theology. All those questions. We're interested in all those questions. So um, definitely the dinosaurs and the fossils, obviously. Yes. But, uh, but all kinds of questions uh, can be asked. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Doran, for joining us. And for everybody who's watching online on the YouTube, I did leave a link in the description to the paper if you'd like to read the paper more in depth. We didn't talk about all of it. We didn't look at every single figure, but it's like a 50 long page long paper. So uh, you can do that on your free time if you, if you have that time. Um, but I want to thank everybody so much for watching, and I want to thank you, Dr. Doran, for joining us. All right, everybody, take care. Dr. Doran, you stick around for a couple more minutes if you'd like. But everybody else, thank you so much. God bless you. Bye. Thank you.